Hi. My name is Colonel John Henry Patterson. I narrated this story in my book, The Man Eater of Savo, which is based on actual events. A man eater in a railway carriage. Towards the end of my stay in British East Africa, I dined one evening with Mr. Ryle, the superintendent of the police, in his inspection carriage on the railway. Poor Ryle. I little thought then what a terrible fate was to overtake him only a few months later in that very carriage in which we dined. A man-eating lion had taken up his quarters at a little roadside station called Kimar, and had developed an extraordinary taste for the members of the railway staff. He was a most daring brute, quite indifferent as to whether he carried off the station master, the signalman, or the pointsman, and one night, in his efforts to obtain a meal, he actually climbed up onto the roof of the station buildings and tried to tear off the corrugated iron sheets. At this the terrified Babu in charge of the telegraph instrument below sent the following laconic message to the traffic manager. Lion is fighting with the station. Please, send urgent help. Fortunately he was not victorious in his fight with the station, but he tried so hard to get in that he cut his feet badly on the iron sheeting, leaving large blood stains on the roof. Another night, however, he succeeded in carrying off the native driver of the pumping engine, and soon afterwards added several other victims to his list. On one occasion an engine driver arranged to sit up all night in a large iron water tank in the hope of getting a shot at him, and had a loophole cut in the side of the tank from which to fire. But as so often happens, the hunter became the hunted. The lion turned up in the middle of the night, overthrew the tank and actually tried to drag the driver out through the narrow circular hole in the top through which he had squeezed in. Fortunately the tank was just too deep for the brute to be able to reach the man at the bottom, but the latter was naturally half paralyzed with fear and had to crouch so low down as to be unable to take anything like proper aim. He fired, however, and succeeded in frightening the lion away for the time being. It was in a vain attempt to destroy this pest that poor Ryle met his tragic and untimely end. On June 6, 1900, he was traveling up in his inspection carriage from Makindu to Nairobi, accompanied by two friends, Mr. Hubner and Mr. Parenti. When they reached Kimar, which is about 250 miles from Mombasa, they were told that the man-eater had been seen close to the station only a short time before their train arrived, so they at once made up their minds to remain there for the night and endeavor to shoot him. Ryle's carriage was accordingly detached from the train and shunted into a siding close to the station, where, owing to the unfinished state of the line, it did not stand perfectly level, but had a pronounced list to one side. In the afternoon the three friends went out to look for the lion, but, finding no traces of him whatever, they returned to the carriage for dinner. Afterwards they all sat up on guard for some time, but the only noticeable thing they saw was what they took to be two very bright and steady glow worms. After events proved that these could have been nothing else than the eyes of the man-eater steadily watching him all the time and studying their every movement. The hour now growing late, and there being apparently no sign of the lion, Ryle persuaded his two friends to lie down, while he kept the first watch. Hubner occupied the high berth over the table on the one side of the carriage, the only other berth being on the opposite side of the compartment and lower down. This Ryle offered to Parenti, who declined it, saying that he would be quite comfortable on the floor and he accordingly lay down to sleep, with his feet towards the sliding door which gave admission the carriage. It is supposed that Ryle, after watching for some considerable time, must have come to the conclusion that the lion was not going to make its appearance that night, for he lay down on the lower berth and dozed off. No sooner had he done so, doubtless, than the cunning man-eater began cautiously to stalk the three sleepers. In order to reach the little platform at the end of the carriage, he had to mount two very high steps from the railway line, but these he managed to negotiate successfully and in silence. The door from this platform into the carriage was a sliding one on wheels, which ran very easily on a brass runner, and as it was probably not quite shut, or at any rate not secured in any way, it was an easy matter for the lion to thrust in a paw and shove it open. But owing to the tilt of the carriage and to his great extra weight on the one side, the door slid to and snapped into the lock the moment he got his body right in thus leaving him shut up with the three sleeping me in the compartment. He sprang at once at Ryle, but in order to reach him had actually to plant his feet on Parenti, who, it will be remembered, was sleeping on the floor. At this moment Hubner was suddenly awakened by a loud cry, and on looking down from his berth was horrified to see an enormous lion standing with his hind feet on Parenti's body, while his forepaws rested on poor Ryle. Small wonder that he was panic-stricken at the sight. There was only one possible way of escape, 
and that was through the second sliding door communicating with the servants' quarters, which was opposite to that by which the lion had entered. But in order to reach this door Hubner had literally to jump onto the man-eater's back, for its great bulk filled up all the space beneath his berth. It sounds scarcely credible, but it appears that in the excitement and horror of the moment he actually did this, and fortunately the lion was too busily engaged with his victim to pay any attention to him. So he managed to reach the door in safety, but there, to his dismay, he found that it was held fast on the other side by the terrified coolies, who had been aroused by the disturbance caused by the lion's entrance. In utter desperation he made frantic efforts to open it, and exerting all his strength at last managed to pull it back sufficiently far to allow him to squeeze through, when the trembling coolies instantly tied it up again with their turbans. A moment afterwards a great crash was heard, and the whole carriage lurched violently to one side. The lion had broken through one of the windows, carrying off poor Ryle with him. Being now released, Parenti lost no time in jumping through the window on the opposite side of the carriage, and fled for refuge to one of the station buildings. His escape was little short of miraculous, as the lion had been actually standing on him as he lay on the floor. The carriage itself was badly shattered, and the woodwork of the window had been broken to pieces by the passage of the lion as he sprang through with his victim in his mouth. All that can be hoped is that poor Ryle's death was instantaneous. His remains were found next morning about a quarter of a mile away in the bush, and were taken to Nairobi for burial. I am glad to be able to add that very shortly afterwards the terrible brute who was responsible for this awful tragedy was caught in an ingenious trap constructed by one of the railway staff. He was kept on view for several days, and then shot. The end.